um, changing work and the sidelines necessity. Here's another point that it, what complexity gave us. Now, 1911, the UK census, what were people doing? Here's the largest occupations. Domestic service, agriculture, and coal mining. One, human service, in the service of others. Well, service is probably the wrong word. Uh, agriculture, i.e. energy for us, for ourselves, and direct energy extraction. Pretty basic stuff. And this is 1911, the UK already had an empire. It was doing lots of other things. Now, in 2008, sales personnel, middle managers, and teachers. What is that about? They're managers of complexity. They are the people in between exchanges. They are the people trying to manage this monster that's jumping around. And they're the specialists in trying to school people to manage this very complex world. So you see something profound has happened there. And you probably see where we're going later on. What do we do with our money? Now, at 1911, but er, this is from a survey from, that was done in 1904, about the same time, in urban Britain. How much were people spending on food of their income? 63%. All right? That's lots of people worked in food. Lots of people spent most of their income in food. Now, it's 10.4%. Much, much less. So, what are we looking at now? And here's just another sort of slightly different look. This is US agricultural workers. Now, farm share of total population, up around 40. It was even higher. You know, this, you know, it had been up here. Down, 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 down it goes. Now nobody's working and producing food. Yeah, virtually nobody. Um, I want you just to note, because we're going to come back to it, Great Depression, 20 plus people, just over 20% of people were working on uh, that sort of basic food production. Now, work and delocalization. Well, we've delocalized, as we keep on saying, of inputs and outputs, dependent on globalized economies of scale. Now, sorry, just on the first thing, what we use to interact with the world, I am, we make our living. We think of it in terms of, I make widgets, so what's important is I make widgets. Um, the things I need, but it also requires the things we take for granted. And part of that is all of that, what I've called before an operational fabric of our world. It's money system is there. There's electricity if I need it. There's legal contract being enforced. There is a global system. All of these things that if I'm starting up a business, I don't even have to think about because they're there. So. Um, <clears throat> that is effectively the difference between me and you guys working and what's happening in Kyrgyzstan to those people. Our operational costs just to allow us to work are much, much higher because we have all of these other associated things that make us viable. Um, and obviously, we're more specialized. Higher oper that's the higher operational costs of doing work, globalized infrastructure, but, but when we move on. Um, and the, one of the final things I want to just look at is sort of more a behavioral, uh, biological thing. Nicole touched on some of it earlier on. Um, and our kind of sphere of attachment. And I've done it in terms of space and time. Space and time. And uh, in the middle, I've called it my mesolimbic me point. That's about me now, what I want. Bah. And, uh, a lot of this is pretty much uh, part of our biology, it's culturated a little bit as well. And as we go forward in time, basically we've evolved to be pretty interested in what happens along here. And we've evolved to pay most of our attention to family community. Now something remarkable happened. Because in evolutionary terms, it's this amazing thing that I give something that is essentially has no intrinsic value. And I send it over the world in the hope that somebody I don't know gives me something or other. It's pretty amazing. Um, 
And that expansion in who I'm willing to trade with, because I expect completion, and the idea that we'd invest in mortgages and pensions is a recent thing, certainly at this sort of level of complexity. And it's what allowed the complexity to grow. And the first thing is we see, well, what was happening? Now, I didn't put wealth there, but we've had the stability that we talked about, that globalizing growth, relatively stable rate we could adapt to. We started to realize, ah, this is how things work. We got used to it. Well, hey, you know, my parents are getting a pension. I probably am, you know, nothing. And risk dispersal. dispersal. You know, we talked earlier on about risk. In time, how do we risk disperse? We get mortgages, we get, or, well, we get pensions. We um, have a society that absorbs risks for us in terms of gives us more economic activity. So if I lose this job, somebody's out there trying to find another one for me, or at least the system is. And more wealth, because we had more discretionary income, we weren't really worried about losing that little bit extra. And somebody said, you know, you should put it in a pension. We went, OK, OK, that's all right. And likewise, in space, uh, wealth, there were benefits of cooperation. If you trade with me, and we all trade with each other, we all become a little bit wealthier. We'll find new opportunities. And we learned that if now, we're always, this might be somebody who's a cheater. Now, this is a very human thing, basic foundational evolutionary behavioral thing. There's always a cheater. So you don't want a system where the cheaters overrule the system or it'll collapse. And the cheaters don't overrule the system. One is because it's in, their op it's in everybody's benefit, more or less, to cooperate. But we also made globalized institutions of trust, like the IMF or the European Union or global trade agreements, or the list goes on. And we have global legal systems. All of these things that, in proxy of not knowing you personally, or my community not knowing you personally, will act on our behalf and punish the cheaters. And as long as you have growth over time, you can assume, without thinking, you can get habituized to there is a global system, my contracts will be dealt with if somebody cheats, and we can kind of forget about our community, et cetera, et cetera. The other side is, on that radius of cooperation, is the economy. For families, we generally have a gift economy, on the close friends. Then barter might be the next stage where you know somebody, and I know I can come back to you if your chickens are not chickeny enough. Um, and then we go on to currency, national currency, and foreign exchange, and so on. So if that is the evolutionary psycho, the, the psychodrama of evolutionary behavior, the mechanism or the means that sort of that brought, what that brought about was, again, this interaction with abstract in money of no intrinsic value, or credit of uh, effectively you know, a promise. And it's kind of interesting because I was reading before I came here, and I did have it in one of the original slides. It's from Daniel Defoe, who wrote uh, Robinson Crusoe. And he was a great pamphleteer. And in the 1690s, he was writing about credit. Because here you had Britain and France sniping at each other on war. But this was really expensive. War paying out of what you have, out of your current uh, income, is a very hard job. And Britain did something, or England at the time. What did they do? They learned a little bit from the Dutch, and they discovered credit. And Daniel Defoe is a great writer and observer, because this is really the beginning of credit. Kind of, this is amazing. Armies march on this thing. You know, whole worlds change because of this credit. And he's got, would you, you know, you're kind of going like that old phrase, would you credit it? Um, and <clears throat> it really marks that point of the discovery of credit as what will be a permanent institution. Because what's happening is you start to have growth, you have expansionism in, you know, it's, it's the beginning of Britain's great empire and all of that. So 
people start to read into it and think, hey, credit is a good thing. Like the Dutch um, had, you know, at the time of you know, the, their glorious period, they were having effectively uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, hundreds of year bonds because they expected the stability to last. Now, this is where we get a bit ropey. Uh, things start to go down. So I just want to uh, mention peak oil. There you have, the, this is uh, your normal curve that you might see or something like it. Here is your net energy because you know, we have less. Um, <clears throat> that, of course, even if you got that, is a total mythology because it depends on lots of other things. It depends on that globalized economy. Um, it's assumed you can extract oil out of the economy and your infrastructure won't be affected. Your money system won't be affected. You'll be able to keep on some level of investment. You'll be able to pay, continue paying the same price, et cetera, et cetera. So they are effectively the assumptions in any of those curves, even the net energy. The net energy only deals with the net energy. So it's all the other things are in that curve. A whole stable world. So nothing changes except we have less oil. Um, <clears throat> so as a sort of physics person, you kind of go, or in an ecosystem, you kind of go, OK, you're going to have less energy. It can't grow. It starts to make sense. It, it, intuitively, that's what you think. In uh, looking at economies, you say, well, because it's non-discretionary, it starts to suck out of the discretionary economy. Also, if you're importing it, you're spending more and more and more on it. So you start to contract your economy in a very economic term. So you can come at it from either angle, and you get the same place. You're in trouble. And you know, if you have a credit system, because you're doing things in the never-never, it must contract. So my issue really is more and more worried about food. Because I think, you know, we can drop. I think, as was said, we are going to see a big drop in uh, energy use and indeed other energy, you know, across the board because you go into uh, a very severe economic contraction. Um, but food is an interesting one because I think we're already on the edge of things and we have very little slack. And obviously we've got... Uh, production is strained, and it will become more strange, strained on average just for those reasons. Uh, demand is rising, as you know. And we have very tightly optimized production to consumption systems. Now, that's a really, I'm saying there's an awful lot in that. They are phase locked. That means that, you know, in Ireland, in the US, you're not producing to keep yourself fed over the year. You're producing for global markets. So however you plant in whatever cycle, it mightn't keep you, you know, you might have gluts, you know, if you were just to live in it, and then emptiness in other parts, because it's not designed to keep you fed throughout the year. Um, it's, as you know, uh, you know, it's uh, just in time delivery, et cetera that there are inputs, that there are seeds. You need to keep buying uh, seeds every year, inputs, et cetera. And uh, you're dependent on the international financial system. You're dependent on credit. You're dependent on subsidies in Europe. We have vast subsidies in agriculture that are really complex, that effectively farms are insolvent, up to the rise in debt, and uh, there is virtually no resilience in the system. It will break. And here is an example that I use of lock-in. I think this is really, really risky, even for, for European countries. Now, the problem is that by supermarkets driving down prices, which is really affecting farmers' ability to invest in anything, they're effectively in servitude, debt servitude and everything else, they are making food prices lower, which is helping say, the Irish economy, because people have that bit more money, discretion, money to spend on servicing their debt and their heat. 
And that is good for the Irish government and for the bond market and everything else. If we want to fix the food system, even if we could, you know, for lots of other reasons, very difficult, we'd have to raise prices of food. We'd have to um, <clears throat> raise prices, uh, somehow decouple the debt from the farmers, a whole range of things. We'd have to get rid of the supermarkets or at least do something very radical. But the net benefit would be rising prices and depressed productivity. Because you might get productivity up in 10 years, but if you pull out those systems now, you just have a drop, drop in productivity. So you'd have a huge increase in prices. So that's an example of lock-in. And then the risks, um, declines in production, declines in purchase, and fair people have no money, basically, can't afford it. And I mean, this not being able to afford it is something certainly we're very familiar with in Ireland, because about 150 years ago, we lost over a quarter of the population to famine. But there was food here. There was grain, there were all sorts of things. But that was being exported because people couldn't afford to buy it. And this is quite normal. And Myrta Sen has written a lot about this in terms of the world today, and historically in terms of, you know, famines aren't always, or very often are not about food production. They're about distribution, they're about affordability and other things. Um, system failures in production, food left rotting in the fields, all of these other things, um, bank, grid, etc. And one of the things, and I'll mention this later, um, that we're trying to look at is we're trying to do top and mid-set level emergency preparations. And one of the things, of course, is rationing systems. You know, for Ireland as a model, because it's relatively, well, in relative terms, easier to try and do than the US. Um, but one of the things you realize is that the rationing we did in, 19, in the 1940s is very different to now because the changes required of the farmers are much different. They're in a much more locked in position. So if you botch that, you could have not only major social unrest, but also a fight back of who's creaming the system, who's making off with it, et cetera. So 